one, so uh, Clue's in charge of that. He'll figure that out. Um, Romans chapter 8. We are here. You know, my favorite chapter in all of Scripture. Now, up until now, Paul has been talking about, he's making his case why you need a Savior, why we need Jesus to rescue us. And he's really giving us the process of salvation, what takes place in the spirit world, what takes place in the court arena where God serves as judge, where Jesus is our defense attorney, where he is justifying us, where he is saying we are pure, he is saying we are holy. So now we're believers. Now we are Christ followers. Now the law no longer has its controls over us because we have died to the law. We are born again, according to John chapter 3, in Christ. So now what? I don't know about many of you, but for me, the majority of my struggles and challenges, temptations and frustrations have come after I said yes to Jesus. You know, I think a lot of times we get this idea that when you say yes to Jesus, boom, you're set, you're done, all's well, and you're just good to go. But how many know that's when life really begins? That's when you put a, a target on you and say, enemy, come after me. That's when you've got to begin to make changes. And so chapter 8 really begins what I'll call the how-to's of Christianity. How do we get through this life that we call being a Christ follower? One of the principles that I want to hit on this morning is this, that there is a huge difference between being the Holy Spirit dwelling in us and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so what Romans 8 is really doing is he's making a, a course turn to where Jesus has done the work of salvation. Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. Jesus did all this, but he thought it better for him to ascend to the Father and send his Holy Spirit so that we would have help, so that we would have a comforter, an encourager, an empower so that we could walk this life of Christianity. And so that's what we want to unpack. Now, real quick, I'm going to be talking toward the end of the message on the Holy Spirit. Um, if the Holy Spirit is something that you're new to or maybe you don't know a whole lot about, I, I want to go ahead and put a plug in for this Wednesday night. I'm going to be wrapping up our series on location with Jesus. We've been looking at about 10 or 12 different sites where Jesus did ministry. And the last one that I'm going to do is the upper room. And we're going to start with communion, which is where he performed communion. And then we're going to end it with the baptism of the Holy Spirit from Acts chapter 2 that took place most likely in the same room. And so I just encourage you to be here if you want more information or just to really be able to experience and see what that Holy Spirit can do for you. Romans chapter 8, perhaps one of the best chapters. Here we go. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in sinful man, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. This message is all about freedom. We want to walk in more freedom. We want to live in the liberty that Christ died to give us. And point number one is simply this. We are free from judgment. We are free from the judgment of God. And we can say a big amen to that. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Colossians 2.14, having canceled the written code, with its regulations that was against us, that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. You see, sin has to be atoned for. There has to be a punishment, a discipline for sin. And so many of us, we, we want that discipline. We, we make a mistake, we sin, and we're expecting God to, to smack us upside the head. You know, we, we put our hand down and we're expecting that switch or that ruler to smack us, you know, go sit in the corner for two hours, you know, no Xbox or PlayStation, you know, uh, bend across my knee, let me just take care of business, you know, all these different things. Unfortunately, that's not how God works. You know, in the, the Catholic tradition, you know, they had what they called penance. 
Anyone here ever have to do penance in their life? You know, we got a lot of hands popping up there. You know, and in a sense, in the natural, you kind of like that. You know, maybe not going somewhere and just saying Hail Mary or what have you, you know, but where you have to pay for your mistake. Because in the natural, you recognize it. I remember one time getting in trouble at school and, uh, you know, the, the teacher or the principal wanted to spank me for what I did. I was in ninth grade. I had a perfect record, never been spanked in school. I was thankful for that because if I got spanked at school, I got spanked at home, and that one hurt a lot worse. And normally I could do my best to cover up whatever trouble I got into at school if I didn't get spanked. Well, I made the mistake, and I told the principal, you're not going to spank me. I'm like, I did nothing wrong. I'm like, you can spank him. He did all the stuff. I said, but listen, you ain't going to touch me. Little ninth grader talking to this teacher or principal. And so she looks at me and she says, fine. No spanking. Go on back to class. I'm walking down that hall like, who's the man? Just took care of business. Friends, I will let you know, I should have taken the spanking. So a few hours later, I get called back to the principal's office. I walk back in there and I said, yes, Mrs. Thompson. She says, hey, um, just want to let you know that the school, we are not going to discipline you for anything. Like, That's what I thought. She says, yeah, we talked to your mom. <laughs> there were words in my mind, friends, that I should have been spanked for right then. And um, it turns out that I think the following week was spring break or something. And my mom decided to arrange for work days for me and this young man who I had a little altercation with. And so we spent two or three days of our spring break at the church doing manual labor for eight hours each day. I should have taken the spanking. But after the discipline was complete, I felt fine. You know, we moved forward. Nobody ever talked about it again. You know, but in Christianity, we don't get that. Why? Because God does not condemn us. He condemned His Son. So every spanking that you deserved, every time out that you deserved, every switch that should have gone across your knuckles, Jesus took it for you. Therefore, you will not have to be condemned for that. And so the judgment that was supposed to be for you, Jesus took. And that's a powerful truth of this passage. You know, when Jesus says it is finished, so much more was finished than our mental capacities can comprehend. But, you know, for many of us, it's tough to grasp. You know, these are stories from 2,000 years ago. You know, in, in America, our history only goes back, you know, a few hundred years. So we're having to base our faith. We're having to base all that we believe on something that took place 2,000 years ago. Well, Martin Luther said it to this way, live as though Jesus died yesterday believe as though he resurrected today and act as though he's returning tomorrow. And if we take that perspective, which is accurate, into our mindset, into our heart, and how we live, it'll change our behavior. Now, this chapter, there's so many powerful truths of the chapter. We're going to try to dive into all of them over the next few weeks. But what Paul is making the case is this. The law condemns you. The law condemns you. The law tells you everything you do wrong. The law points you to the need for a Savior. And so when you're looking at this, you recognize that you are never going to measure up. You will never receive full salvation by obeying the law because we all fall short of the glory of God. So what happens in chapter 7 is this. We died to the law, if you remember from last week, and then we are born again, married into a relationship with Christ. And so the law no longer has any power over us. The law no longer has control of us. We belong to Jesus. You've been set free from death. You've been set free to life. The law cannot claim you. The law cannot condemn you because Christ suffered and paid the price for you. And so when you look at it, the law can't control you either because Christ then deposits his Holy Spirit within you to help you live a life of holiness and be obedient to Jesus. Now, there is therefore now no condemnation. That is in the present tense. There is therefore now. So many of us struggle with that principle. So as a believer, there's times where we go through life and we make mistakes. There's times as a Christian we've sinned. And so what does that mean? 
What does that have to do with condemnation? Well, to understand it, let's pull that word out and divide it. Condemnation versus conviction. To convict is to recognize that you've done something wrong. You know, the world would call it the conscience is all of a sudden tweaking you. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have taken that. I shouldn't have acted that way. That, that, that's conviction. Conviction points you to the cross. Conviction brings you back to Jesus. Thank God for conviction. If you are not receiving conviction in your life, there's a challenge there. When you do something wrong and you feel nothing wrong about it, you've got a problem. Conviction is good. Conviction just brings us back to Jesus. Condemnation pushes you down. Condemnation gives you a sentencing. And so what happens is when we become a believer, that condemnation has no power over us. It's been broken. There is therefore now no condemnation. Conviction, yes. Condemnation, no. So as a believer, which probably, you know, the majority of us in here are all believers in this, you make a sin. You commit a sin. You have a bad thought. You, you say a bad word. You commit a bad deed, whatever the case may be. Conviction or condemnation? Well, that's easy. That's conviction. You're not going to be condemned. There is therefore now no condemnation. So what happens? So here's how it works. You put chapter 7 and chapter 8 together. In chapter 7, you are connected to the law. You break the law, what happens? If I go out here, and I believe our officer Rob Burris is here, and Rob is sitting in our parking lot, and he's got that radar gun, and my, uh, my little hybrid, which, Rob, seriously, it can't go fast, so no matter what the radar gun says, it's got to be 15 miles per hour slower. But it's 35 miles per hour in here, and he clocks Pastor Andrew, zipping by. I even wave while I'm on my hand device, and I'm going 72 because I want to get home for dinner. Rob and I are going to probably have a little chat. Rob's going to pull down that window and be like, license, registration, insurance card. I'm like, Pas uh, Mr. Rob, this is Pastor Andrew. He goes, license, he, there's no respecter of persons. I broke the law. And at that miles per hour, with the handheld device, and if I give a little bad attitude, guess what? He may give me some sterling silver bracelets. <laughs> and so the law then puts me into jail. That's condemnation. That is when you are connected to the law. We get that. We understand that. But as believers, that can't happen to us. <laughs> Not the case with Rob. He'll arrest you. Listen, I'm talking spiritually here. You know, and, and so with condemnation, that can't happen to you as a believer. So what happens when you sin? All right. Well, my beautiful bride, would you walk up here, please? I love catching her off guard. Give it up for my wife, Rachel. All right. So say I'm driving by the church and she's sitting in that passenger seat. She's got my sweet tea right there. She, she's looking at a Dunkin' Donut and saying, you really want this, but I'm not going to give it to you. And, and I'm driving 72 miles per hour down this road. Her hand is into my knee, and it's squeezing, right? Yes. She is saying, get off that phone because you can't have a handheld device. It's against the law in Tennessee. Guess what? Is she going to put me in jail? No. What is she going to do? She's going to be like, why don't you enjoy tasting that first bite of dinner? You know? No, what's happening? There's an offense between us. I have offended her by doing what it is that I've done. And so what happens is this, the offense remains between two people in love, not between me and the law. And so what the law can't punish me for... She sure can. No, but what happens is she then is frustrated by it. All right, you can sit down. Thanks for you. And, and so what happens is in our relationship with Christ is it's like a vow relationship. There's an offense. Now, Jesus doesn't hold grudge. Jesus isn't going to be angry at you. But what that means is then later on we get home and, sweetie, I, I, I drove a little fast today. I was on my phone, and I, I know that bothered you, and I just want to say, I'm so sorry. Would you please forgive me for that? And uh, I'm going to do my best to drive the speed limit, and um, 
I'm going to, when, when Pastor Carmen calls me, I'm going to ignore it because if I'm driving, you know, we're just not going to do that. Um, you know, if, if I need to change the radio station to Billy Joel, you know, whatever. If you're in the car, listen, it's only what you want to listen to. We can do Michael Buble and, you know, and, and so you see what's happening here is it's a one-on-one thing of me going and making it right. It's already right. Listen, we're still married. She still loves me. She's still going to take care of me. All that stuff is still wonderful. But when there's an offense that I cause, then I need to go and make it right. I need to go and say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'm going to do my best to drive properly and do whatever it is that I might be. That's how it works with Christ. He doesn't throw us in jail. He's a loving spouse. He's, he's just wanting us just to come and say, I'm sorry. He's just still there. He's still going to serve. He's still going to prepare for you, provide for you, bless you, and be there for you. You're still going to get all the benefits of that marriage relationship. However, you can tell in the home when something's just a little off. And let me tell you, spiritually, if you feel something's off, it's not Jesus. It's you. That's conviction. That brings us to our knee in front of our Savior to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, help me to do better. It's a humbling process. That's what he's getting into with life through the Spirit. We've been set free. Now, we have memory problems, though. Many of us, we know too much about ourselves. Many of us, we know all the mistakes we've made. And so the problem is, is you and I, we dwell on our own inability to keep the law. We dwell on our own brokenness. We dwell on our own failures. The problem is, is we camp out there rather than moving forward and dwelling on the goodness, the grace, the mercy, and the love of Jesus. If for one moment we as believers could get our eyes off ourselves, get them on the cross of Calvary, we would see the loving eyes, the loving arms of a heavenly Father who cares about us, who died for us, who gave a son for us, and he receives us as we are, and he gives us the Holy Spirit to do better. But all we are is self-centered. We look in the mirror like, oh, I did this. I did that. And the reason why is we're conditioned that way. Anybody ever study that, uh, that guy Pavlov and his dog? You know, I was reading up on that again to make sure I get this analogy right, but I'll still probably butcher it, you know. But the, he wanted to do this study of a dog. The dog salivates when he sees his food and gets hungry. I remember when I had a dog, Daisy, she'd start licking her lips. And if it was wet canned food, you know, which was her, like, Thanksgiving meal, you could just see the saliva coming down. And, well, Pavlov decided to find out if he rang the bell and then fed the dog, could he get it to where the dog was conditioned to begin to salivate as soon as he heard the bell without even seeing the food? He proved the point that it was correct. He was conditioning that dog. You and I are conditioned to wallow in our own misery. You and I are conditioned to stay in sin. You and I are conditioned to beat ourselves up when we make mistakes, when we have failures. And so what Jesus spends his ministry on earth doing is presenting a gospel of reconditioning. What he's doing is reconditioning our mind and our spirit. You know, you've heard it said, you know what? Hey, if you've got an enemy, what do you do? You go beat up that enemy. You take care of business. What does Jesus say? Go love your enemy. When somebody does wrong to you, you want retribution. Get me a lawyer. Hey, get me a big stick, whatever it takes. Jesus says, hey, if he takes your cloak, give him your shoes too. Jesus takes it a step further. He says, if Daniel walks up here and punches me across the face right now and says, go Patriots, then I'm supposed to turn the other cheek and let him punch the other side. And the dolphins do it every year, you know, might as well. (laughs) And so what Jesus is doing is reconditioning us. Peter, I'm working on a sermon series on Peter for next year. Peter cracks me up. So here he is, he's in a campfire. You know, he's hanging out with some people in a courtyard, and this little person says, hey, I recognize you. Weren't you with Jesus? No, don't know him. Then somebody else said, yeah, I recognize you. You're on Jesus' Instagram. I saw you all doing a selfie together. No, it wasn't me, just a lookalike. Somebody else with a beard and really good biceps, you know. (laughs) Peter was all about himself. Then a little girl 
You are. You're St. Peter. I had some of your fish in the Sea of Galilee. Nope, not me. And then here's the rooster crow. Then he remembers what Jesus said, but before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. What do you think it was for Peter the next day when he heard that rooster crow? Think he just jumped out of bed and said, oh, it's going to be a great day? Or do you think tears just began to hit his eyes? The next day, the rooster crows. I don't want to get out of bed. I can't believe I did that to Jesus. I saw him transfigured. I saw him walk on. I walked on water with him. Why would I do that? A few days later, he heard a rumor that Jesus might be resurrected, but he's out in the Sea of Galilee. He went back to the beginning. He gave up on this whole thing. He went back to fishing. That's all he ever knew beforehand. That's what he's going to return to. That rooster crows, he wakes up, dries his eyes again, and says, I'm just going to go fishing today. I know I'm scheduled to go do a devotional at the school downtown, but you know what? I just, I'm just not qualified. I've made too many mistakes. I can't believe what I did to Jesus. Then Jesus, where's my buddy Peter? goes out in John chapter 21 and he sees Peter out there in the boat. Yeah. Man. If he could only see himself the way I see him. Jesus goes, lights a little fire. Get some breakfast going. Hey guys, how's the fishing going? Not well. Try the other side of the boat. Where have we heard that from before, guys? <laughs> uh, who's this guy I think he is? But, hey, I'm game if you are. They throw the nets over. Then they pull a little bit more. Can you imagine? They're, they're, they're starting to pull on this net. The boat's probably tipping a little bit. And Peter's like, whoa, who was that guy? They start pulling in the nets. 153 fish. And all of a sudden, Peter says, I know who that is. And he does his best Michael Phelps impression. He gets to that coastline. He starts running up, and then all of a sudden, he probably heard the rooster cry because they'd been going all night. I don't know if the rooster crowed at that moment, but in my mind, I think it did because he just stops. And then Jesus says, Peter, I made your breakfast. He puts his arm around Peter and says, hey, do you love me? Oh, yes, Lord, you know I do. Feed my sheep. Hey, Peter, do you love me? Oh, Jesus, oh, man, you know I do. Tend to my lambs. A few minutes later, he's just finishing off that fish. Peter, do you love me? Jesus, I've said it. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. And I think Peter then gets it. He just asked me three times. I denied him three times. You see, Jesus reconditions the way that we see things. Jesus reconditions the way we act toward things. You see, you and I, we are the freest people on the planet. You know, it's natural for people to be born free. Unfortunately, there's nowhere outside of Christ that we have true freedom. You say, well, Pastor Andrew, how do we have freedom? All I know from church is what I'm not supposed to do. You know, all you do is talk about these rules and regulations. I mean, all my friends are out having fun, and I'm sitting at home watching, you know, uh, Christian channels with my wife, and, you know, we're, like, bored by it. Well, what I would encourage you to do is turn on our new YouTube channel, listen to a little Pastor Andrew. You'll have the best-sounding sleep you've ever had in your life. And and so you, you look at this... But these rules and regulations, what are they? They're guardrails. They're for your protection. Listen, Christianity ought to be the most joyous, fun experience of your life. You know, because if you are following Jesus, all is well with your soul. If you are following Jesus, you'll recognize that truly great is thy faithfulness. And you'll recognize that these guardrails that your friends have hopped over They're deep down, they're drowning in the water, they're struggling, they need rescued, they need Jesus to save them. You're walking on the streets and all is going smoothly. They're for your protection, not for your 
punishment or for Jesus to be mean to you. And so when you look at it from that standpoint, you recognize that we follow these rules and regulations not out of duty, not out of regulation, not because it's law, but because we're so deeply in love with Christ. And when our perception changes on why to read what the Bible says and then do what it says, we find great joy in it. And that's really all Christianity is. Read the book and do what it says. Read the book and obey it. But we're conditioned for guilt. We're conditioned to wallow in our spirit when we make mistakes. But what Jesus wants to do is recondition us to where we recognize grace And we take the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and instead of wallowing in guilt, what I want you to do is be reconditioned to then celebrate with gratitude, my God has forgiven me. My God has set my foot upon a rock. What used to tear me down and destroy me, now the Holy Spirit has lifted me up, and I'm stronger because of it. Because now I'm more aware of the way that the world works against me, how the enemy wants to destroy me. And so greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. And so when we change, when we recondition our heart and our mind to a posture of gratitude, thankfulness for grace, all of a sudden we begin to walk in freedom and recognize that sin plus grace equals gratitude. And then he goes on, verse 5, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. I read a book years ago called The Battlefield of the Mind. Powerful book. Just so happens it's written by a, a female minister. How many are thankful that God can use men and women to advance the cause of Jesus Christ? You know, and, and so Joyce Meyer's book, and, and I've read a lot of Beth Moore books too, and they, they've impacted me. They're powerful. And, and so what it shows here is our mind is where the battlefield is. Now, I, I read a lot of commentaries on Romans 8 over the last few weeks. And I saw some differences between the commentator's perspective on this passage. A lot of the commentators believe that Paul is contrasting an unbeliever and a believer. And so I put the contrast there, an unbeliever operates in the flesh, a believer operates in the spirit. An unbeliever leads to death, a believer leads to life. A a, a mind uh, that is toward the flesh has war with God, a mind that is controlled by the spirit has peace with God. A mind that is warped and following the flesh displeases God, a mind that is led by the Holy Spirit pleases God. I get that, and they could be accurate. But you know what, as I was reading this and just praying through it more and more, I still think Paul's talking about you and me here. Because I think as believers, we still struggle on this this list. I think our mind still focuses on our old nature. Our mind still gravitates to cultural values. And when we do that, that's when our walk with God begins to to move off course a little bit. And I think Paul, following the context of chapter 6 and 7, going into 8, is telling us as believers how we've got to live. You cannot allow your mind to operate the way it used to by following the things of the flesh, but you have to allow the Holy Spirit to recondition your mind to operate and flow by the way of the Holy Spirit. And so to mind the things of the Spirit is to never forget our privileged standing. What does that mean? As Pastor Carmen said earlier, and we're going to look at next week in detail, we are sons and daughters of God. We have privileged standing. You know, I remember watching an interview with uh, General Kelly right when he was taking the position of chief of staff to the president. And one of the things that he shared is, I've got to do a better job than my predecessor at who's allowed in to the Oval Office with, with great ease. And he was kind of alluding to the fact that President Trump's daughter, Ivanka, had pretty much open access into the Oval Office to talk to Dad. 
And what he wanted to do is block that off. But how many know, if you've read anything about our president, not many people are going to tell him what to do. And you know what? There's not many people that are going to tell God what to do. And so God has this beautiful throne room of heaven. And guess what? You and I are sons and daughters of him. We have complete access into the throne room of God any time we want. And there isn't any being on this planet or in the supernatural that can prevent us from walking boldly into the throne room of grace to talk to dad. We can do that as often as we want. And so when you do that, we get the mind of Christ and we recognize who we are in Christ. We recognize who we are in God. The mind of the Spirit then will also begin to produce fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. And then verse 9, you, however, you are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he does not belong to Christ. So when you said yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit enters into you. You have a Holy Spirit of God presiding within you. That's why Jesus says, it's better for me to leave so I can send the helper, the comforter, the paraclete in the Greek. Makes me sound smart when I use Greek. If anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he does not belong to Christ. Verse 10, but if Christ is in you, how many know that Christ lives within you? How many are thankful for the grace of Jesus? Your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And so for you and I, what that means is this. The same spirit that breathed life back into Jesus' body 2,000 years ago lives within you. The same spirit that spoke through Jesus' mouth in that tomb one day and said, Lazarus, come forth, lives within you. The same Spirit that preached the Sermon on the Mount lives within you. The same Spirit that worked through Jesus to perform miracles, to walk, walk on water, to resist the temptation of the enemy lives within you. And so when I claim scriptures like greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, I don't do it just to get an applause or to rile up the crowd. What I do is speak the truth on that because when we recognize the spirit that is within us, there is absolutely nothing impossible that we can do as a body of believers because the gates of hell cannot stand against a church unified with this spirit within you doing what it is that it's called to do. Amen. And so that spirit's alive within you, moving mountain into the sea, bringing dead people and breathing life back into them. And that's the gift of salvation. So you and I, we have the freedom to walk in the Holy Spirit. If you're not familiar with the Holy Spirit, read John chapter 14 through 17. Jesus does a huge dissertation on it. He does that in the upper room. We're going to unpack that Wednesday a little bit. And so when we recognize who the Holy Spirit is, we recognize that He is a Spirit that's come alongside. He's praying for us. He's praying through us. He's helping us in our weakness. You know, a couple years ago, I was doing some um, light weight lifting with some guys up in Michigan. And we were doing a, a press day on a bench press. And uh, I'm getting into the, the position. I don't remember what the weight was, 350, three, I don't remember. You know? and, and so I'm getting down, I'm getting ready. And they had a guy there that kind of leans over you, and he's called the spotter. And, you know, it, it was a max out day. And so I'm doing it. They want us to try to get five of these things in. Listen, friends, I walked away saying I did five of bench presses of whatever that way was. Listen, if I did two of them, I'm lucky. This guy behind me, he's probably not even realizing what he's doing. He's doing all the work for me. And I'm just doing my best to push and to try to get some veins to bulge out to make it look like I'm working hard, you know. And I'm just like, come on, I got this. And he's like, oh, yeah, you do, you got this. I mean, his arms are like sweating because he's doing all the work. That's how life is with the Holy Spirit. You don't have to do a whole lot of work. You can let go of the bar as far as I care. That Holy Spirit's going to keep doing the bench reps for you because that's the power of the Holy Spirit within your life. You don't have to do life alone. Let the Holy Spirit do the heavy lifting. Let Him guide you. Let Him change your mind so that you can see things differently. 
You know, when you go into situations, you may not know what the answer is going to be, but you can pray for the spirit of discernment, the spirit of wisdom to take over. You know, when you're going to have a meeting and you don't know what words to speak, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart bring glory to you, my Lord, my strength, my rock, my redeemer. You know, when, when you don't know how to pray, we're going to read in Romans chapter 8, there's moments I don't know how to pray for certain things. And then the Spirit of God begins to pray for you, begins to pray through you. Temptations come. Oh, I don't want to do that temptation, but it looks really good. The Holy Spirit's right there. Andrew, step away from the platform. You will trip on that step. You know, he speaks to you. He'll guide you. You know, there, there's times where Rachel and I, we've been driving, and, you know, all of a sudden we just feel like we got to take a different direction or whatever to get somewhere, and, and all of a sudden we find out something that we avoided. You know, there's times where God just leads you. There's times where I've called people in this room or texted you, hey, you were on my mind, what's going on? And then I find out major issues have taken place. Listen, I'm not smart enough to figure that out. That's the Holy Spirit of God enabling us to do what he's called us to do. So the next time someone's on your heart, message them, check in on them, pray for them. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will work through us. The Holy Spirit will speak through us. And the Holy Spirit will help us to do everything that God has called you to do. Riley, you're about to go into a season of your life that there's going to be long, dark days. And you're going to wonder, why in the world did I sign up for this? I want you to remember the prayers of your grandparents and your family that the Holy Spirit will speak to you, He will encourage you, and He will drive you to do more than you could have ever imagined, and you will do more for your country and for your family than you could ever have hoped for. You have a destiny, and God's Holy Spirit will drive you to fulfill that as you surrender and allow His voice to speak to you. And that's true of every single one of us. If we will allow Him to lead us, the times that I get myself stuck in mud, friends, is the times where I operate in my own mind, my own gut reaction, and don't pause and say, Holy Spirit, guide and lead me. Because He will speak to you. He'll even start shouting to you. You start drifting on course, the louder His voice is, the closer you are to a pit. And He wants to keep you from that. The Holy Spirit helps us become who Christ has called us to be. He helps us, He strengthens us, and He changes us. Father God, I just thank You for Your Holy Spirit. God, I thank You for the transforming power of the cross. I thank You, God, that in Your infinite wisdom You felt it better for You to send Your Son back to heaven and send us the Holy Spirit. And right now, Lord, as everyone's just sitting in their seats, God, would you just begin to speak to each and every one of them? Would you just begin to speak to them as their father, as their friend, as their savior, as their Lord? That they just begin to hear the blessings of this chapter. For those that are here and they just feel like there's the condemnation of the world and of you around them, that they would hear there is therefore now no condemnation. Lord, that you begin to whisper in their mind that they are controlled by the Spirit of God. And the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is within them. God, would you begin to speak to them that they have a spirit of sonship. And that the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Would you begin to speak to them that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. That when we don't know what we ought to pray for, that the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Lord, would you reveal to each person here the truth that we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. God, would you let them know that we can say this, that if God be for us, there is no one who can be against us. God, would you let your people know that God has chosen them, that he justifies them. He doesn't condemn them, but through Christ has raised them to new life. So then who can separate us, therefore, from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution or famine or nakedness, danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
And Paul tells us through the voice of the Spirit, I am convinced that neither life nor death Neither angels or demons, neither present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will ever separate us from the love of God. Church, would you just stand with me? Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have in you. And Father, right now, we once again offer our lives as living sacrifices to you. And God, right now, if there's anyone in here where their relationship is off with you, Father, we know that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know, God, that you are faithful. Lord, right now, would you just convict us with your Holy Spirit to just simply say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Help me to do what's right by the power of your Spirit. With every head bowed, if you're here, and the worship team's about to lead us through a song, but you'd say, Pastor Andrew, I I need to get right with God this morning. I'm far from God and I need to make sure I'm a son or daughter of Jesus. I want to make sure that he has cleansed me and redeemed me. I want to make sure I have the promise of heaven. If that's you, would you just lift your hand up? I want to pray for you. Thanks, dude. I see that hand. I see that hand. Got that. Got that. Thank you. Anybody else? Lord, we thank you for these hands. We thank you for their hearts. Lord, we thank you that the Holy Spirit transforms by the blood of Jesus. Father, seal this word in our hearts and now receive our worship. As Pastor Jeff leads us through a song, I want you to worship. I want you to bless the name of Jesus. But our team is going to be here up front. If you want prayer, if you just lifted your hand and you want to say yes to Jesus and you want somebody to pray with you, we're going to be here. If you're struggling with something, if you're going through a difficult time in your life, you want somebody to agree by faith in your prayer, we're going to be here. If you're sick and you want someone to believe for God's healing, We are here from you. If you need provision, we are here to pray that the Jehovah Jireh, the God of provision, will touch your life. Pastor Jeff's going to lead us. Please don't hesitate. Come forward. Let us pray with you and let us stand firm in the faith for God to meet your needs.